Designers can achieve big reductions in the embodied carbon in buildings. Amy Hatton, Thornton Tomasetti's Corporate Responsibility Officer, is talking with in-house experts about how they're reducing the effect of buildings on climate change. Here's how Embodied Carbon is a production of Thornton Tomasetti. Hi, and welcome to Episode 9 of Here's How Embodied Carbon. This series explores how engineers and designers can reduce embodied carbon, or the emissions associated with building materials, and minimize the negative impacts of buildings and other structures on climate change. I'm Amy Hatton, Corporate Responsibility Officer for Thornton Tomasetti, a multidisciplinary engineering and consulting firm. We've been focused on embodied carbon for over a decade and are channeling all of our capabilities to tackle climate change. I'm talking with colleagues about how they're achieving reductions in greenhouse gas emissions on their projects. Today, I'm talking with my colleague, Nisha Kakti, a senior consultant in our sustainability and resilience practice. She's done some promising research into alternative technologies for steel production that could lower its embodied carbon footprint. And she's going to share some of her findings with us today. Hi, Nisha. Hi, Amy. I really enjoyed this research. And I'm excited to talk about the opportunities for expanding the discussion of low embodied carbon steel. There's more to it than recycling and using the most efficient manufacturing processes. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing all about it. Where do we start? We start with how steel is made, which are two main types of manufacturing processes. Right. Uh, We introduced these processes in episode two of this podcast, but I'm sure we could all use a refresher. What does it involve? With one process, usually referred to as integrated steel making, raw materials are fed to a center plant's coke oven to produce the primary feed and coke for a blast furnace. Next, the blast furnace produces pig iron, which is then fed into a basic oxygen furnace, or BOF, to produce steel. That steel is then poured into a ladle where the metallurgy is modified to get the properties needed to manufacture the different types of steel that we have available to us. This process is called BOF. This is the big energy user. And from our earlier episode, we know that the other process is called EAF, right? Right. The other process involves an electric arc furnace, or EAF, which is less emissions intensive and uses mostly recycled steel. Direct reduced iron, or DRI, is made from iron ore and natural gas, and is added to the furnace along with recycled steel. Then, this steel is poured into a metallurgical ladle, like the one we used at the integrated steel plants, to generally make the same type of steel products. But right now, most EAF products are of lower quality. EAF could probably be adjusted to make more higher quality steel in the near future if there's a demand for it. Historically, integrated BOF steel making provided a much higher quality due to its low recycle content. That said, electric arc furnaces are the predominant way to produce most of the construction industry's steel, including rebar and white flange, steel with high strength to weight ratio. Sometimes products like plate or hollow structural sections, like HSS, are only available from integrated steel plants. In the US, 70% of steel is actually produced by EAF plants, but looking at a global production share, the integrated process still dominates the market at 70%. So EAF is more efficient, but there's a lot of BOF. Is there any nuance in the greenhouse gas emissions associated with these plants, or is it just a black or white situation? It's not black or white. There is some nuance, and that's in regard to the emission scopes. Let me first explain what I mean by emission scopes. Scope one is what our emissions are produced on site in a steel mill. Scope two is all the emissions that are associated with the electric and utility supply. And scope three is all of the upstream emissions from suppliers. With integrated steel, scopes one and three emissions are very large compared to the EAF furnaces. This is largely due to the raw materials, coke, and other fuel that are being used in the blast furnace. When we look at the EAF plants, 
we find that the emissions are almost equally divided between scopes one, two, and three. Some of us here at Thor and Tomasetti found this equal distribution intriguing and decided to do a bit of research to see what's going on in that breakdown and look for ways to reduce th those emissions even further. So you started by looking at the most efficient process. I guess even the better options have room for improvement and can get closer to net zero. What did you learn about EAF furnaces? We found that with these furnaces, scope one emissions come mostly from the use of natural gas, primarily in the reheat oven. And so we asked, what if we replace that natural gas with an alternative fuel like hydrogen? Can we reduce that number drastically? Another big area of emissions is in scope three, the upstream emissions, because a lot of steel plants procure iron from elsewhere instead of making it on site. So we decided to look into ways to produce iron that has a lower global warming potential than the typical DRI process. DRI is short for direct production of iron, and what that process basically does is it removes the oxygen from the iron ore through chemical reduction caused by the ore reacting with the carbon in the natural gas. Using carbon-based feedstock in this reaction is what's causing the carbon dioxide emissions. Interesting. So you were looking for fuel sources that could replace the natural gas in EAFs and also ways to do DRI with fewer emissions. Exactly. We focused our search on options that are already being chased after for decarbonization opportunities, especially those supported by big steel manufacturers in the U.S. and abroad, and those being funded by U.S. Department of Energy grants. There is a wealth of information about technologies that have made it past lab scale and are in the process of developing larger pilot facilities these material production trials bring them closer to reality for the end user. What we found is there are a variety of solutions for each process. For example, there are several companies investigating using hydrogen as a reducing agent or electrolysis in the DRI process. Many other companies are looking at developing carbon capture systems for coking facilities or integrated steel furnaces. Meanwhile, there are some more obvious options for emissions reduction, like substituting the electricity used with green energy from renewables or nuclear. Since EAF facilities use a lot of megawatts, small modular reactors may be a great option for a consistent power source. So do these alternatives also help reduce emissions from the more energy-intensive BOF plants? Well, we did a similar study for integrated BOF plants, and found that scopes one and three dominate their emissions. Scope two emissions are almost negligible in BOF in comparison and can be easily dealt with if those plants switch to using green electricity. For scope one, the blast furnace, that's the one that uses coke to make the iron. That's the one that causes about 90% of these emissions. So if we can eliminate the use of the blast furnace altogether, that would be an ideal scenario. So the blast furnace could potentially be replaced with low carbon iron making processes that we talked about before. Another option which doesn't replace the coking and blast furnace is to use carbon capture to prevent the emissions coming out of these carbon heavy processes from being released. But this isn't necessarily a proactive approach. What do you mean by this? By not being proactive, I mean it's not taking measures to avoid the generation of CO2 in the first place the steelmaking process would still generate the same amount of emissions as it does today, but would emit much less to the atmosphere. Carbon capture technology collects and stores these emissions and prevents them from entering the atmosphere. The CO2 is stored in perpetuity underground or potentially used in other markets. While that's beneficial, our primary goal should be to prevent these emissions in the first place. There are several measures we can take. We can offset the carbon dioxide intensity in the coking process by blending biomass or biochar with traditional coal. Biomass and biochar, what are they? Biomass is an organic material from agricultural or forestry waste. When it's burned with very little oxygen, biomass becomes biochar which is a charcoal-like substance that can be used to replace 
some of the coal in the coking process. Another way to proactively reduce emissions from steel production is to reconvert the blast furnace off gas into a usable fuel. This is done by reacting the carbon dioxide and the carbon monoxide in the off gas with green hydrogen to make methane. Lots of chemistry. <laughs> but this can basically be re-injected into the blast furnace. This creates a carbon recycling loop. But ultimately, most of the expansion to low carbon steel making capacity will happen by building new EAF facilities instead. There are certainly a lot of realistic options for reducing emissions from steel plants. Are the technologies you talked about today within reach? A lot of the technologies to partially reduce emissions are available today, like EAF and using renewables. Others are available, though they may take a while to get integrated, like carbon capture. Some aren't commercially available yet, but they will be developed in five to 10 years like the net zero DRI. It's a good idea to try to incorporate some of these alternatives into our specifications right now so that we can push for the best steel possible in the future. What I want to emphasize is the fact that for any of these steel products, you have to have a layering of technologies to get to net zero or even close to net zero. Any technology that you implement will only get you part way. For instance, Green electricity will get you about a 30% reduction in global warming potential in an EAF facility. You still need to incorporate other technologies to bring the emissions down to net zero. It's good to know that there are some fairly simple solutions that at least can get us part of the way to net zero steel. And it is promising to know about the technologies that are coming. Nisha, thank you for sharing your insight with us today. Folks, there's more. Follow Thornton Tomasetti for more episodes of Here's How Embodied Carbon.